Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today, I'm going to continue the study of the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, if you have not seen the previous studies on this, uh, um, they are available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, but today, I'm going to uh, pick up where I left off last time the beginning of chapter 10. Now I will read it first in the KJV because I'm a KJV firstist, but after reading it in the KJV, I may uh, find it to be helpful to look at it in uh, another translation. The one I usually use is the Amplified. So let's begin. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Hmm. Interesting. I was just thinking of this word apothecary the other day. Let me read this in the Amplified to see how it phrases it. Dead flies make the oil of the perfumer give off a foul odor. So a little foolishness in one who is esteemed outweighs wisdom and honor. Hmm. I don't see anything in this translation that would make me understand apothecary. But... Uh, Okay, so dead flies make the oil of the perfumer give off a foul odor. So that's a bad thing. You don't want dead flies <laughs> in your perfume. Uh, and just like dead flies are bad for the perfume, so is a little foolishness um, uh, in one who's esteemed. So someone who is a respected person being a little bit foolish sometimes, it outweighs their wisdom and their honor. So if you're someone that people respect and admire and then you do something foolish quickly, your reputation goes way down suddenly just from one mistake of foolishness. So I guess we need to guard against foolishness at all times. Let's look at verse 2 in the KJV. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Hmm. What's the significance of being at the right hand or the left hand? Um, I guess it's worth mentioning again that uh, the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes is King Solomon. Uh, he's also the writer of the book of Proverbs. I completed a study of the book of Proverbs um, recently. Uh, it, it took about 10 months to, to uh, teach it. And those videos are also available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. But wh what we learn from the book of Proverbs is wisdom. Uh, that's the whole point of the book, to teach us wisdom. Uh, and many times in that book, Solomon compares the wise person versus the foolish person, how they, uh, how they conduct themselves, their decisions and their consequences. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, since it's also written by Solomon, it, it has a lot of similarity to the, the book of Proverbs. And here again, we see the comparison of a wise man versus a fool. Let me look at verse two in the, in the Amplified. A wise man's heart turns him toward the right, which is the way of blessing. But a fool's heart turns him toward the left, which is the way of condemnation. So I guess this is just a kind of uh, like an ancient uh, uh, viewpoint uh, that uh, the right hand is good. The left hand is bad. <laughs> Matter of fact, uh, my wife, She's uh, she does some things right handed, some things left handed. She may be naturally a lefty, uh, but she was 
taught growing up in uh, parochial school, uh, Catholic school, uh, they wouldn't allow you to write with your left hand. They thought it was a sign that the devil's influencing you. So I, I think in these ways, people associate the left hand as bad, the right hand as good. So it says again, a wise man's heart turns him toward the right, which is the way of blessing. Uh, but a fool's heart turns him toward the left, which is the way of condemnation. Now back to the KJV for first verse three. <clears throat> Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him. And he saith to everyone that he is a fool. Well, uh, when you do something foolish, you're announcing to everybody you are a fool. And it really does have serious consequences. Uh, behaving foolishly tells everybody a lot of, about you. Of course, everybody is foolish to a certain extent, just like everybody is a sinner to a certain extent. I know that some people sin more than others, but we all sin to a certain extent. And uh, regarding sin, you know, the variety of sins, the type of sins may vary from one person to another, but it's not the variety of sin. It's not the, it's not the uh, uh, quantity of sin. Uh, it's just the fact that man is a sinner, and that's why we need the Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, in this in the same way, every person is foolish, at least part of the time in their lives. And no one is completely from birth a wise person. Wisdom generally takes a lot of time and experience to acquire. Hopefully, as we get older, we do get wiser, but that's not always the case. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 3. In the Amplified, even when a fool walks along the road, his common sense and good judgment fail him, and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool. I like this word, this term, common sense. I've also heard it expressed that common sense is very uncommon. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that we think that just wisdom, basic good sense, good judgment, that it's it's common. Everybody has that. That's the common, the, the norm. But common sense really is a, it's kind of a, a, what is it when two words oppose each other? A oxymoron. Common sense, really? Uh, common sense is something that has to be learned and acquired over time through experience, just like wisdom does. Common sense is actually very uncommon. Uh, go back to the KJV, verse four. If this spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place for yielding pacifieth great offenses. Well, if the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, so if the ruler gets angry with you, uh, you know, you're in trouble if the man in charge is, is uh, you know, upset with you, whether it's, you know, in your household, your father, uh, in, in your in your city, your mayor, your police department, and the government, the, in this these times, the king, whoever has the power, if they, if they have power and they're angry with you, that's a bad place to be. But what I'm not understanding here, it says, leave not thy place. In other words, I guess maybe stay home, don't go out. Leave not thy place for yielding pacifieth great offenses. All right, I don't understand that. Let me look at that in the Amplified. Verse 4 in the Amplified says, If the temper of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post showing resistance. Oh, okay your post, I guess, if you were a soldier and you were on guard duty and you were, you were assigned to uh, to stay in that place and watch, uh, if you leave, it's showing resistance or defiance. <clears throat> Do not leave your post showing resistance because composure and calmness prevent great offenses. <clears throat> so I guess 
if the ruler is angry with you, don't give him any more reason to be angry with you. Be very, very careful to be on your very best behavior. If they're angry at you, you've got to do do your best so that they calm down and they don't get even more angry. Verse 5 in the KGV, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. There is an evil which I've seen under the sun. Uh, this term, under the sun, in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is repeated over and over. It just means that it exists everywhere. Or, or, or everywhere in the world, this exists. Uh, as an heir, there's an evil under the sun, as an heir which proceeded from the ruler. So rulers all over the world make this mistake. Folly is set in great dignity and the rich sit in low places. Folly is set in great dignity. I guess folly being doing stupid things, being a foolish person uh, is admired and the rich sit in low places. Let me see it in the amplified verse uh, five and six. There is an evil I have seen under the sun like an error which proceeds from the ruler. Folly is set in many exalted places and in great dignity which the, which the rich sit in humble places. Folly is set in many exalted places. So folly or foolish people are often put in powerful positions of authority. Uh, but then it says, and, and in great dignity, which the rich sit in humble places. Sorry, I can't explain that one. Verse 7 in the KJV says, I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. So he's seen things that seem to be it's, it's not the norm. Normally the prince is, is uh, riding on the horse and the servant is falling behind, ready to serve. Uh, but it's, sometimes he says this is, is reversed. Uh, verse 7 in the, in the Amplified says, um, I have seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the ground. Well, if this was done uh, by decision, a, a, a prince says, you ride on the horse and I'll walk. I mean, that seemed to be a, a quite a, a, a role reversal there. It would be a humble prince that says uh, to his servant, you get to ride and I'll, and I'll walk. Uh, so Solomon says he has seen this. Verse uh, 8 in the KJV, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Okay. If you dig a pit, if you create a problem, you're going to, you're going to, uh, like, in the, like a pit, you would fall into it. You're going to be hurt by what you've caused. And whoso breaketh the hedge, a hedge is there for a reason. It's there to keep something out, and and uh, it's like a wall or or a fence or a barrier. Um, and and it says if you if you break it down, a serpent shall bite you. So bad bad things can get in if you break down this hedge. Verse eight in the Amplified says, "He who digs a pit for others may fall into it." Okay, now that makes more sense. You dig a pit for other people, it may backfire on you and come back to bite you. And a serpent may bite him who breaks through a stone wall. Yeah, this is just like if you make a, a devious plan against someone else, uh, sometimes your plans 
come back to bite you in the butt. Uh, verse 9 in the KJV, Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. He so, whoso removeth stones, maybe that's the same way as taking down the, the hedge, um, will be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. Cleaveth wood, cleave means hold on to wood. Verse 9 in the Amplified says it this way, he who quarries stones may be hurt with them. Okay, quarrying as you're digging up stones from an area that has a lot of stones to move them and, and use them. Uh, that's what a quarry is. Uh, it says he who quarries stones may be hurt with them. So you're taking stones and you're intending to use it for a certain purpose. And yet it, you may end up being hurt by it. And he who splits logs may be endangered by them. So you, you, your plan is to do something that is constructive. You're splitting logs or you're removing stones from an area for a purpose to build something or to, to split the logs so you have logs for fire. You're doing something with an intention that you can use it for a purpose and sometimes it backfires on you. He who splits logs may be endangered by them. Let's look at verse 10 in the KJV. If the iron be blunt and he and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. If iron be blunt, I guess we look at an axe, an axe that is blunt, and he do not whet the edge. That means, I guess, to sharpen it. Then must he be more strong. So if you're using an axe that is dull, you've got to use more strength, more energy to, to accomplish it. Uh, your, your, your chopping will be more difficult. Uh, he that cleaveth oops, uh, but wisdom is profitable to direct. So just as a person is wise to use a sharp axe instead of a dull axe, a wisdom is, uh, uh, must be used properly also. Right? Let, me, let me see how it says it in the uh, Amplified. If the axe is dull and, and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. But wisdom, the wisdom to sharpen the axe, helps him succeed with less effort. Okay. So don't be a fool and lazy. And the axe is dull and you're too lazy to sharpen the axe and you end up working harder because you're, you're chopping with a dull axe. Be wise and sharpen the axe. I guess we could expand that principle to a lot of things in our lives. You know, preparation sometimes Take a little time and prepare uh, instead of rushing in to, to do something. Think it through, make an outline, make a plan. And it takes a little longer to get it organized, but if you do it correctly from the beginning, then the actual work itself will be much easier. Look, back to the KJV, verse 11. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better <laughs> the serpent will bite without enchantment uh, in other words you don't have to hypnotize the serpent uh, and, and, and try to take control and send him off to attack someone as uh, i've seen uh, in in movies people be able to like play a play a um, a flute or something and somehow get control of serpents. So surely the serpent will bite without enchantment. In other words, you don't have to enchant a serpent to go out and bite. That He does not naturally. And a babbler is no better. 
you don't have to entice a babbler to, ba to babble. It's just they do that naturally. <clears throat> Verse 12 in the Amplified says, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious and win him favor. Oh, that's, uh, what's the wrong verse? That was 12. Verse 11 in the Amplified, if the serpent bites before being charmed, then there is no profit for the charmer. Hmm. Well, that's a lot different than I thought it was. KJV, verse 12, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The words of a wise man are gracious. Well, wisdom has a lot of virtue. And, and, and uh, if, if we are wise, when we speak, we'll be gracious to, to others. Grace means that you're kind uh, just naturally. They don't have to do something to win you over to make you kind. You're naturally kind and generous and, and unthoughtful to them. Some define grace as unmerited favor. So you are giving favor to someone. You're being generous to someone without them doing anything to earn it. So the words of a wise man, if a, you're wise, what you say you will be naturally gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. <clears throat> but if you're not a wise person, if you're foolish, the things that come out of your mouth, what you say, this foolishness will swallow up yourself. You'll end up, you know, suffering from your foolishness, from the foolish things you say. <clears throat> Verse 12 in the Amplified. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious and win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. Verse 13 in the KJV, the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. Verse 14, a fool also is full of words a man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? Yeah, in the book of Proverbs, often when Solomon talks about a fool, there's everything about a fool is as bad. There's no virtue in foolishness. But one thing that, that fools do is they tend to talk a lot. They're babblers. Uh, they, they, they're full of foolishness and they can't wait to express it and verbalize it and, and show everybody. And it said in an earlier verse here that the, the, the fool talk, talks, he's, he's exposed. Everybody can see that he's a fool. He's easily identified. And it's because they can't resist talking and proving that they're a fool. Let me look at that in the uh, verse 14 in the Amplified. Yet the fool multiplies words, though no man knows what will happen and who can tell him what will come after he is gone. So the fool multiplies words. That means he just can't stop talking. Talk, 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 talk. Proverbs also tells us that a wise person is... quick to listen. I think this is in James. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So we're, we're taught that we should be good listeners. Resist talking. Restrain yourself. You don't have to be always talking. You're going to learn by listening instead of talking. Uh, The fool multiplies words. So if anything, don't multiply your words. You know, subtract your words and spend more time listening. Verse 15 in the KJV, the labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to the city. 
The labor of the foolish wearieth everyone with him, because a foolish person, when they attempt to do any kind of work, they, they're foolish in the manner they do it. So you get more tired. It's like the person that wants to chop with a dull axe. They're foolish, and they end up wearing themselves out. And you are, if you are led by a fool, then you'll be worn out. Verse 15 in the Amplified says, The labor of a fool so wearies him because he is ignorant that he does not even know how to go to a city. <laughs> Verse 16 in the KJV, Woe to thee, O land, when thy child is Oh, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. <clears throat> so if, if you live in a kingdom and the king is a child, woe to you. It's going to be difficult to be led by a child. They don't, uh, hopefully, at least they have the most basic wisdom is that they will, they will have many counselors. They'll have wise counselors. Uh, but, uh, you know, in America, you know, it was, voting age was 21, and then they, they changed it to 18. I, I think voting age should be 30, at least 30, 35, 40. I mean, to me, most people are they're so foolish when they're young. Almost everybody's viewpoints about life and, and politics and economics and religion, all these, they change as they get older because they, they have, with experience and education, they learn and they change. So letting young people uh, vote is foolishness and, and have, having a young king would be a foolish thing. But sometimes since that position is inherited, you know, a kingdom is stuck with a, a, a child king. Uh, verse 16 in the Amplified says, Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and when your incompetent officials and princes feast in the morning. <clears throat> Feasting in the morning just means that they can't wait to feast instead of doing their job and looking out for the kingdom and, and uh, doing the work that needs to be done. Uh, they can't wait to feast until the end of the day to to relax, have a feast, enjoy the fruit of your labor. They want to have the feast early in the morning. Verse 17 in the KJV, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Yeah. If you live in a kingdom, you want your king to be the son of nobles. If he's a son of a noble, uh, then he probably will receive the best education, have the best counseling, uh, and the princes eat in due season. That they're they're just uh, they're they've got the priorities right. They eat it at the end of the day uh, after they've done all the work, and they're not. Uh, they're not getting drunk. Let me see how it says it in the Amplified. Blessed, prosperous, and admired are you, O land, when your king is a man of noble birth and your princes and officials feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Verse 18 in the KJV. By much slothfulness, the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. Slothfulness is laziness. Uh, if a person is lazy, then uh, even the building you live in will fall apart because you're too lazy to even keep it uh, maintained. Verse 19, a feast is made for laughter and wine maketh merry but money answereth all things. <laughs> well, we do learn from the Bible that uh, it says money is the root of all evil. 
some translations say, say money is the root of all kinds of evil. But money or greed, greed is an excessive desire for money. Uh, greed is a sin, it's a vice, it's not a virtue. And uh, greed is based upon acquiring more more stuff, more th more money, so that you can have more things, more materialism, and uh, uh, that is not virtuous. Uh, but on the other hand, we have to understand that uh, money is necessary because money represents uh, supply and abundance. Your needs are supplied. Uh, you have an abundant life. You're not wanting or lacking, and that requires money. I think. Uh, how does this saying go? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, I can't remember. There's some cl cliches I've heard about money. Um, verse 19. Oh, no. Verse 20. The final verse of this chapter. Curse not the king. No, not in thy thought, uh, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hang which hath wings shall tell the matter. Well, I'm hoping the amplified will help me with this. This has some probably kind of, you know, ancient uh, uh, you know, way of expressing something that I. It's not common today. I'm going to read verse 19 and 20 here in the Amplified. The officials make a feast for enjoyment instead of repairing what is broken and serve wine to make life merry and money is the answer to everything. Moreover, do not curse the king even in your bedroom. Yeah, you think that in the bedroom you can say what you want and it'll always remain private, but it doesn't. It, there are leaks. And in your sleeping room, do not curse the rich, for a bird of the air will carry the sound, and a winged creature will make the matter known. <clears throat> well, I don't think we're to take this literally that birds are going to overhear your con private conversations and go repeat it, but... I, there's a saying that uh, a little bird told me. Um, I think my mother used to say that. Uh, I guess that's a way of, of saying that uh, you know, they, uh, they heard it somewhere and, and it's maybe it's through uh, gossip or Yeah, obviously, it's, we shouldn't take literally that a bird spoke to someone, a bird overheard something and flew somewhere and told someone else. But the fact is that uh, the things you say end up repeated. All right, that's the end of chapter 10. Uh, I'll pick up at chapter 11 next time. But I'd like to end this, this study the way I end every study, and that is, um, uh, a couple of minutes to tell you the good news that salvation is a free gift. Um, if I asked you now, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? What would you say? Uh, probably 97% of the people of the world that's not a random number. That's done through a lot of calculation. <clears throat> we did a complete hangout on that subject recently. But we estimate that 97% of the world's population, their opinion uh, is that in the afterlife, if we go to heaven, it will, it will be determined through personal merit that... Uh, uh, those people who get to go to heaven have earned it b because they've they've uh, uh, done a lot of good things and they've abstained or refrained from doing bad things. Now, 
everybody can understand and admit that no one is completely good and no one's completely bad. You know, we, mankind just, as we look at each other, we, uh, it's all um, uh, relative. It's all um, uh, man, as we judge each other's goodness, uh, we know that some people are better than others in, in man's eyes as we look at each other it's clear some people seem to be you know honest kind generous virtuous other people seem to be you know hateful and vulgar and so on uh, but uh, no one could go before god and say i've been perfect but i but they people can go to god and say i think i've been pretty good compared to most people and and that's that's how the world views this and answers the question um do i think i'm going to go to heaven i think i probably will and why because i'm a pretty good person um that's the 97 percent. that's the philosophy of the world but that's not what we learn from the bible the bible tells us the exact opposite the bible says that it's impossible to earn salvation and go before God and say, I've really behaved myself. I've really done really well. Uh, and and if, you, if you plead your case to God and, and he, like that, he, he would just say, don't, don't deceive yourself. You, you've, you've not been perfect. And my standard of judgment is perfection. Can you honestly say to me, that you've been perfect your whole life. If person's going to be honest, they have to say, no, I haven't been. But that's the standard you've got to meet. If you want to enter heaven th through your own efforts, through uh, if, through achieving it, through your, your religious works. So you need to understand that's impossible. And then you have another group of people, a tiny, tiny percentage of the people in the world that have studied the Bible and learned the truth that uh, salvation is not earned, but the sal salvation is received as a free gift. Um, but you, you receive it because you've put your faith in the Savior. If we understand that our, we cannot go before God and argue that we deserve heaven, instead we need to go before God and say, oh, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm, I'm, I'm not worthy, but Jesus is my savior. I'm trusting Jesus. I'm relying on Jesus. Um, a Christian, and I'm, I'm purposely saying Christian rather than Christian, because I want to differentiate from the, 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 the general popular viewpoint on Christianity and Christians. Even most so-called Christians believe that salvation is earned, but a, a Christian, uh, the Christianity we find in the Bible, that person says, I don't deserve it, but I'm depending on Jesus. I'm relying completely on Jesus instead. That's, that's what I want you to understand. And that's why I, I want you to change your mind. Stop thinking that you can somehow earn salvation, admit defeat, admit that you failed, and admit that you need to be saved. Understand that there is one Savior, Jesus Christ, and he is gracious, and he is loving, and he's merciful, and he will give you place in heaven. He'll give you eternal life in heaven freely as a gift. That's what the Bible says. Some facts about Jesus you should understand is that He's not merely a prophet. He's not just a great example for us to live by. No, not just a great religious leader. He truly is eternal God Almighty who came down from heaven and became a man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and he became a man for a purpose. He said the reason he, he became a man was so that he could die for our sins. And he did die on a cross and that suffering and death on the cross did serve as a satisfactory payment 
for all of our sins. So Jesus paid for our sins and then he was buried. And then three days later, he was raised back to life bodily. And this bodily resurrection of Jesus is the sign or the proof that Jesus offers you saying, look, I paid for your sins and I raised myself back to life to prove I have power over life and death. And if you will trust him, put your faith in Jesus. Do not put your faith in yourself, in your own ability, in your own efforts, in your own accomplishment, but instead put your faith in him. When you do that, then he gives you life everlasting. And he proved he has, he is the sole source of life, but with this bodily resurrection. So trust Jesus and you're going to go to heaven and it's guaranteed. You can absolutely be certain because Jesus, the Bible says, uh, God cannot lie and he cannot break a promise. Jesus promises you eternal life in heaven if you'll trust him. I hope you will. Put your faith in Jesus now. Thank you for watching. I uh, hope you will join me again for the, the next broadcast of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.